just to introduce uh, the Architects Climate Action Network. So ACAN is a group of uh, grassroots organisation of individuals who are looking at ways to kind of mobilise action around the built environment uh, and architecture and otherwise. We don't just have architects involved, we've got lots of other people, but it's also between architecture students and practitioners and professionals. So we've got a very broad range, but it's kind of taking architecture and climate activism and doing it collectively. So mobilising as many people as possible to do more than we can personally do by ourselves. Uh, next slide, please. So ACAN has three separate aims that kind of guide the, the campaigns and the kind of events and the workshops and the kind of uh, actions that we take and we do. Uh, the first of these is to decarbonize now. So as lots of people know, uh, construction is the 40% industry. So about 40% of the world's carbon comes from construction. So we are not going to get to net zero if we don't do something about that incredibly fast. So ACAM's first aim is decarbonize now and to take that very seriously. Secondly is ecological regeneration. So the second aim is about kind of healing the, the damage that has been done. We are in a climate and ecological crisis. This is not just about carbon, this is about land and landscapes and communities and nature. So it's about regenerating and healing that. And third of all is cultural transformation. So if we're going to decarbonize and make the built environment more sustainable or even regenerative, that's going to involve a change in how we do things. So how we practice, how we teach, how we kind of relate to one another in the professions and what disciplines actually work together as well. So if we have the next slide as well. So this is the kind of climate literacy working group. So there are multiple different kind of groups in ACAN who do different things, everything from kind of education to kind of professional standards and planning policy and all sorts in between. But climate literacy, who's hosting this evening, is focused on cultural transformation. So looking at how do we change how we're doing things in such a way that we can change the culture in architecture and construction towards being more sustainable and more climate literate as well. Uh, next slide, please. So to welcome you this evening, this is uh, as part of Practice Action, which is a collaboration between uh, Architects Declare, the RIBA and ACAN. Uh, this is, these series of events and climate conversations are in parallel to masterclasses being run by Architects Declare using their practice roadmap. So over the course of a few months, up until September, there's going to be a programme of events based around this, and this is feeding into the ACAN part of that as well. So we'll go to the next slide. And yep, so we've already had kind of climate literacy. The one we just had two weeks ago from Architects Declare was understanding the impact of practice and projects. And we're now into where to start. So where do we begin and what do we start doing in our own practices as well? So I think this is the time I'm passing across. So if you'd like to take over, Rebecca. Yeah, sure. I'm just going to have a quick little chat about the last masterclass on um, understanding impact and measuring impact. Um, so in the first part of the masterclass, we were looking at how we define and how we measure carbon emissions in the practice itself. Um, so we can begin thinking about how we can reduce that, um, what targets we should be looking at in terms of reduction and over what sort of timescales we should be looking at as well. And um, if you could hop onto the next slide. Um, so we, sorry, the next slide again. Perfect. Um, so as part of the session, we had an interactive Miro board and all of the participants were invited to share where their practice is currently at. And we all sort of um, added sticky notes to the Miro board to explain that. And these are all going to be collated and they'll be sent out as part of the pack um, that will follow this session. Um, and it'd be great if we could discuss that a bit more this evening in terms of what everyone's practices are currently achieving and what you're looking to achieve. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, so then we started looking at measuring the impact of the projects and buildings that we're sort of designing um, ourselves. And then in groups, we had a discussion. Um, we were given some images of, pra of projects that have already been constructed and looking at those images we were discussing what the strengths and weaknesses of each project were and um, how we thought that sort of the whole life carbon of those could be improved. Um, so I think we've got a poll set up it would be great to know if anyone in this session attended the, um, the previous masterclass um, and it would be great to see if following that like how you left the event feeling and how you're feeling about sort of measuring your impact in practice and on your projects as well. 
So it looks like we had a few people in the masterclass in the session. Um, some people were feeling ready to start and excited after that session. And some people are already on their way there, which is great news. And the masterclass that's going to follow um, this session in a couple of weeks is um, working with the client brief. Um, so it'd be fantastic if more people would like to sign up to that one. I think we're going to put the link to the next set of AD events in the chat. Um, but I think for now, I'll probably pass back over to Scott to introduce this evening's session. All right, thank you very much. So I'll close that. So just about this event this evening, can we have the next slide? Just, yeah, so practice action. We're looking at transforming practice and where to start because this has become a kind of matter of urgency in terms of seeing, even in the past week, we've seen kind of heat records smashed all around the world. And we've not had much conversation about even things like overheating. So there's still quite a big disconnect between what's happening in terms of the climate emergency and what's being done in practice. But it is very, very overwhelming. And in some circumstances, you start on a practice and there isn't anything going yet and you're wanting to start it or you're getting integrated into what's already going and putting in your energy there. So what we'd really love is for everyone just to share as openly as possible we can have to how are things going in your own practice as we go in the chat box. So if you've got a response or something comes up that's similar, please let us know and we'll keep the conversation going. And we'll just quickly get on to introducing our speakers as well. So we have the next slide. So we are incredibly lucky to have people at very different points in the career. So Tara, Pena and Zafir are going to be our panelists this evening. And we've got facilitating, there's myself, um, my name's Scott, I guess he and him, uh, Rebecca and Vincent as well. So for each of our speakers, could you please, after I've said your name, pick the other person to follow you. But what we'd really love as an introduction is instead of just going for like a run sheet of your CV like we always do, how did you personally get stuck into making change and transforming your practice? So Tara, if you would like to begin and kind of pick that question up and run with it and then pass to whoever you'd like to next and we'll take it from there. Thank you. I like how the intro is like a big question, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tara Balade and um, I lead a small practice. I'm a co-director of a small practice in London, Balade Design Studio. Um, and how we got stuck into making change and transforming practice. I think uh, we're, as a practice, I think this context is important. We're five years old, or just under five years old. Um, and from the outset of starting practice, so um, being a sustainability-led practice was really important to us. Um, and the reasons for that are manifold. Um, one was I'd recently become certified as a Passive House um, designer. So I knew better, so I really couldn't design any any worse really after after you go through the course you, you find it difficult to design any other way the second is that um we from the outset as a practice we really spent a lot of time thinking about the values and ethos of the practice um and once you have a value about making everyday places for people extraordinary you really ha have to move towards a certain direction and that's sustainable and regenerative um, design and that's obviously always um, evolving and then the third um aspect was the business case for it so being quite strategic and commercial and thinking 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line, how does a business, like how does a small business ensure that um, it continues to thrive, recognizing that 75% um, of architectural practices in the UK are small businesses um, and many obviously fail within the first year and within the first three years. So it was thinking about the sustainability of the actual business as well. So it was a multi-pronged um, approach. Um, so I'll stop there to help the spotlight um and i'll pass on to diana thanks tara uh thanks everyone for for the invitation to to be part of this uh event tonight uh diana dina head of sustainability and regenerative design with howard tomkins uh very very happy to say we just won uh, aj 100 uh, practice of the year um uh how did i get stuck into this <laughs> Um, it kind of was a, a, a meeting of, of two, two, two um, journeys. 
uh, my own from kind of architect and then doing um, um, a master's at UCL on sustainability um, design, sustainable design. Um, and then going on to work with uh, beer architects were a small practice, but focused really um, strongly on passive house design and uh, monitoring of, of um, low energy and passive house buildings, performance in use. And that was kind of a way of getting the information from the masters into, into practice, into architecture practice. And that was where I met a lot of the people that are now kind of uh, in this area um, at AD, ACAN and elsewhere in, in London. Um, and um, I think their website has amazing kind of um, a, a wealth of, of information and, and research into um, uh, sustainable um, kind of design. Uh, and from that, uh, I did another kind of a bit of stint uh, in a practice doing uh, design work, but then I realized that I wanted to be more involved in uh, sustainability as kind of focusing on this kind of advice to architect side. And that's when I, um, I kind of joined forces with Howard Tonkins, who were on their amazing uh, journey at that point, had just uh, founded the, um, co-founded the Architects Declare movement, and were looking for a, a sustainability person uh, to kind of guide their already in-house um, uh, kind of um, existing sustainability team. Uh, and that's where um, all of this kind of started to, to grow. And um, it's been an amazing journey this last two, two and a half, three years of all. In September, I think it will, it will be three years. So yeah, that's that's us. We're now we're 120 uh, staff. There is a sustainability team of around 20 people, um, and it's kind of it it's it it's always a bit of a struggle in you know getting um, enough time to do a bit of research and to get everybody on board. But um, it's exciting. Yes. So passing on now to Zafir. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, Dekan, for the invite. Um, yeah, I'm Zafir. Uh, I'm a uh, part one at DRMM uh, and also did my master's at the uh, London School of Architecture. Um, and how I got involved in sustainability, I guess, is I guess it's also in two halves because I joined DRMM and they're quite uh, like environmentally and socially focused like practice. Um, and quite a lot of the people when I joined were actually already involved in ACAN, Architects Declare um, and Letty. So then through them, I then ended up joining ACAN and was like quite heavily involved with ACAN education. And then almost came full circle that after that, there were so many people in all these external groups that we thought as a practice, we need to have some kind of like routing internally. Um, so then all of us like kind of banded together and created like various subgroups um, within the practice. And then we like kind of fall under now the like umbrella term of like sustainability and regenerative design is like, like collective group that um, we go by. And I checked before this call, there's 20 people in that group and there's 40 people in our practice. So we're at 50% of our practice is technically in that group. So soon it will be everybody, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, it's great to be here. All right, fantastic. So are we going to the poll now? So there's another one. Just double check the run sheet that I've got everyone on the right. There we go. Yes, we're on the right time. So even just to start straight away, we're going to go to a very honest question because this, this can sometimes be quite difficult. Is If you have started to try and make change, how did it actually go? Because we know that things don't always go swimmingly and perfectly the very first time. Sometimes they do. And it's quite great. Other times it takes repeatedly. So, and if you haven't started yet as well, that's also very valuable to know. It's fantastic to get a feeling for the room. So we'll just give this another couple of minutes and partial change occurred. That's only one person, nothing changed. That's fantastic so far. We're doing well. That's an optimistic look at how the world looks today. And some successful as well. So great. So we'll just keep that going a little bit. And da -da -da. Right, pull two. Okay. Can I jump in and ask oh, yeah. uh, what what his answer to that question would be? Um, as a few, uh, well, um, recent part one and uh, grad, uh, part of the LFA, and how, how's it been a DRMM? To influence, like to, to the poll question, you mean? Have yeah. Tried to influence? Yeah, I think it's been. I think uh, again, I think quite lucky that where. I work at DRM, they're quite open to 
I guess people bring in knowledge from other places so because people have got their experiences outside of the office like in other organizations and groups and even uni people like come to those meetings and I guess share that knowledge so we have like um like I guess a rough agenda in terms of topic items but then I'd say that there's always like any other business and people bring in stuff like oh I went to this talk at this place and I learned about this and then suddenly it like branches off and it just um people yeah we like form new subgroups or things like that just happen out of people's interests so I think it's just yeah the openness of other people has been quite valuable for other people to bring their um yeah like knowledge and interests into the practice. All right Dan did you have anything what was the very first thing that you brought in when you began in your, your latest practice then so how did that go as kind of bringing in your in initiative to really push kind of like the architects, the clear agenda and your practice? Sorry, so how did it go? <laughs> yeah, what was the response like? <laughs> um, uh, I think the fact that there was already a sustainability team in the practice helped a lot. Um, at the same time, it, it seemed like there was a bit of a moment in the beginning, at least when um, everybody was kind of, oh yeah, we have somebody in-house now, a dedicated role for this. We can all kind of take a step back and relax. Um, and um, it, it was, um, for me, it was a big change because I was going from uh, working in medium, small size practices into this humongous uh, machine. Uh, it had 80, there were 80 people at that point and now 120, like I said. And, and I didn't know exactly uh, where to start and how to go about things. Um, but I had been to a Reba mentoring session, um, one of those very short sessions where you go to talk to three people 10 minutes. And I basically went there and said, I, I will start this role. Could you please give me some ideas? Where do I, how do I start this? And after having a bit of kind of several uh, conversations with various people, I kind of put together a plan, five point plan. Um, um, and then uh, after I started in the role, actually, I realized that if, if, the, if the practice is large enough to have a bespoke role for, for this, it's good to actually try and get in touch with others who are doing the same thing and see how you can help each other. So I basically started to um, um, coordinate a bit of a, an informal group for sustainability leads in other practices, just to say, let's help each other and let's, um, let's get ideas of you know, how we do things. And that was really, really humongous uh, help. And the five point plan was uh, discuss um, or have a strategy for practice at practice level, projects, um, training, advocacy, um, and anything to do with marketing bids, uh, you know, supporting the practice in, in, in getting projects. Um, and then I basically started to understand how the practice kind of um, hierarchy and um, um, kind of uh, structure was and where I need to actually have discussions to, to try and influence change. Because there are uh, three uh, design teams and it's good to actually have um, representatives in the sustainability group for, from all of the design teams and then try and um, influence uh, each one, one by one. Thanks. Sounds, sounds amazing that the, uh, the, five, the five point plan and being able to, to branch and put all those, those actions into place and sort of seeing how you get from point A to, to point B way off, way off in the future. Very good advice from yeah. another head of sustainability was try and not do everything at once. Focus on going step by step. Take one thing and focus on that. And then so focus on if you want to do carbon office carbon footprint and set the stuff in place for that, all the procedures and policies in place for that, work on that. And then think about the practice strategy. Think about what you do at pro project level. And we started to do it um, to, to implement a uh, design toolkit. So we go through certain things uh, when we do project reviews. So kind of try and take them one by one, not spread all at once because you won't go very far. That was a very good advice. Again, um, collaboration and, and getting advice from others openly seems to be uh, the best way forward. <laughs> I was wondering, Tara, uh, do you have a similar five-point plan or maybe it's a couple more points or um, a couple couple less? 
Um, I wish it were that strategic. Um, <laughs> we, um, I, I think it's because of the size of our practice, um, we're able to get everybody on board. Um, and in fact, actually, because we set out our store quite clearly early on, we found that um, when we were looking for a team, when we were looking for architects and architectural assistants, those who came to us may not have had the experience, but already had um, a passion and a desire to go in that direction. So actually, you know, convincing um, the team to move in that direction wasn't really the challenge. The challenge came more in how do we start to apply, how we all can, can um, learn together and, um, and apply. Um, it's been really useful because the types of clients that we have, again, because we have um, quite a clear message, um, also have a desire for sustainable design. So when we speak to our clients, it's usually trying to decide, you know, what where we're pitching is, whether we're pitching at RIBA 2030 or Passive House, for example. But um, internally for the team, it was a matter of we're all going to we're all in this together. We're going to ups, we're going to have to upskill together. Um, I'm the only one within the practice who is certified in Passive House. Nobody else is. Um, but the role of advocacy, I think, is quite important, and particularly in small practices and people who. Um, I don't know. I think I think you you have a voice, particularly in small practice. Um, and I say that because I think we, as the directors, we tried to create um, a space that allowed of openness that allowed everybody to speak and contribute. Um, and that was important because I remember one of our team um, came to us and said, actually, there's this uh, free course um, with Bristol Uni um, online U U U W E, and it was the introduction to zero carbon um, buildings. And so we all went on that course together and it was a six week or eight week course, I can't remember. Um, and we all went on that together um, and online we were on the same thing. If there were events like this or Letty's retrofit guide um, launch, we we're all on that together. And then we used another um, approach, which was, um, um, project reviews. We have a lot of internal project reviews, um, and each of them focused on sustainable and regenerative design. Um, and then collectively, we started to um, develop our internal um, design guide, which looked at what sustainability meant for us, and that was environmental, socioeconomic, um, and therefore the process we'd go through through e with each project. So the questions that we needed to ask at each um, RIBA stage, for example. So um, we're collectively learning together and figuring it out together. I think that's especially about the openness, because I found in uh, the uh, practice I work in as well, kind of when you can get people around to even talk about something that we don't all know everything about, it sparks so many questions and it's really good to like apply that to a project, to look at a project. But I think it's probably a question that I've had from students quite a lot and work I've done in universities is how can they get started in when I say a start, what a part one, a start in the practice or a part two, what would be the advice that you would give to it from the perspective of the kind of uh, being a director of Tara? Like, what would your advice be to someone who's just starting or someone applying for jobs? How how would you like someone to demonstrate that passion or not even to demonstrate it? Like, not even to say that dampen it down, but how should they communicate that best to show that's what they want to bring to a job as well? I think that's a great question, actually. Um, I think what works best is that, particularly um, if you're applying for a job or even within the practice, that you're, you're thinking about the practice as a business. So beyond your passion as sustainability lead, and you know it's great for the world, um, and it's obviously important and critical to demonstrate that passion, I think it's really important to think of the business as, as a business, the practice as a business. Um, and you're coming from the perspective in that, you know, practice, if you if you want to survive, if you want to have great clients, if you have, want to have the best projects to work on um, five years from now, 10 years from now, sort of long term thinking, then we, you know, it, I, you know, I think we can implement X, Y and Z, you know, the five five point plan. And here is how I think we can start. Um, it's just about opening up that conversation, but also not coming and sort of expecting the director to say, OK, great idea. I'll take this and I'll go away and think about it, but that you've done the thinking to say, here's how we can start. So if it is carbon literacy, actually there's a six week course. Why don't we all do, do this? It's going to take this amount of time from everybody. So it's it's just kind of thinking through the business side of a practice. Um, and when you do that, it's, it's, um, it's much easier to have a conversation because I think, you know, directors know, okay, well, you're invested. 
Oh, that that's fantastic. That's a really great thing that we can now kind of signpost to because it's now kind of end of the semesters at the university as people are starting to look. There are now job ads starting to appear for the first time in years. So that's I think something really great just to push on that. I will throw across to Zafir. If you got a point to make? I'll just say on the other side, as like as a part one, I think just being vocal is really important. I think that's something that we, or like as a practice, they realise that as part ones and part twos, like if you do voice your interest in these things, like it will like almost always be like listened to or at least taken into account. Um, because like we have like as part of our appraisals, like just like discussions on like what else would you like to discuss or something else that like you personally would like to I guess explore. And if you say, I don't know, I want to be, um, looking at this in a sustainability group, I want to be more involved in um post occupancy evaluation and more like times than not it's like things are like rearranged or you're trying to put on those kind of projects I think yeah just not being scared to voice your opinion is also I think really important yeah that's what I was wondering Zafir if you could uh, expand on that a little bit like are, are there some sort of things that you've you've said specifically that you've you've seen that have come into into practice and uh, even if they are sort of super small um or, or some things that you've said just fall on on dead ears and you've had to rephrase it and go back again at a later time i guess one thing that i like mentioned was being like interested in like social sustainability quite a lot and then uh like a few weeks later i was put in touch with this associate and then between us we set up the edi like subgroup of our practice actually it went like surprisingly well really well surprisingly quickly um and then now like that actually is i think the biggest group of our sustainability group is like 15 or so people in that because something that i guess is also sometimes missed is the social sustainability so like quite a few of us had voiced it but just needed like the joining up so i think it actually was through like appraisals and all these reviews that we have people had voiced it individually and then the people who are obviously looking through it noticed this common thread and just basically put the people together and then we just chatted discussed what could be done um and then slowly that group formed so that was actually one example of yeah raising something and then not, not even intending it to become a group i just wanted to like i guess be involved or help but it just turned out that there were quite a few other people also um, interested in the same thing, which is, I think, another reason like being vocal helps because you never actually know who else is also got the same interests as you. Can I jump in here like really quickly? I think it's um, I think that's a really good point, actually, because um, again, if you think about it from the practice perspective, the, the directors are always really busy. So actually, there's, there's someone who has a passion for something. You're more you're you're very likely to get it through because they're like, right, there's someone who's interested in this run with it because we know it's important. So it's um it's more likely than not going to work. Or can I ask you about the, you said that you were sort of producing like a practice strategy, like design strategy as such. Um, so I feel like I, I work in a small practice and I've been quite vocal about wanting to sort of work on these things. And luckily it's been quite well received, but now the biggest barrier seems to be sort of finding the time and energy to access information that I need to sort of expand my knowledge and I wonder if perhaps having more of a, a strategy in place that looks at a project and says right what things do we need to consider is that sort of what you were sort of alluding to with that that strategy yeah absolutely um, and what was really useful is that we did it in a collaborative way so I think um, each person took a topic there were like six six of us and um everyone had there are many subtopics within that but <laughs> everyone had a particular topic to start with um and so what we did was dedicate um time to that so i'm going to say it was once a week or once every fortnight i can't remember if we did move things around where whoever was responsible for say social sustainability would do that research and have a, and we'd have a workshop um on i don't know tuesday lunchtime um what we also try to do or what, what we ended up creating um and are is still developing is um it's an online it's a website in effect an internal website and we just used like google sites um and it, it, the website has a tab for each topic and it's a very simple template in that you will you're looking at a project but you're asking the same question so um if we're looking at environmental sustainability you know question could be is there an existing building on site? Can it be retained rather than being um, demolished? The next question is, 
um, how are we calculating embodied carbon and then links to useful tools or what should be the operational target here are we talk what are we targeting RIBA or let ETC here are the useful tools so it, it was we 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 started with we want to try and ask five to ten questions for each subtopic um, give a case study and also links to useful um, tools but everybody had to present um, and I think they're now they say maybe about 13 or 14 pages within that sort of website. Um, so everyone had to, had a go at at least two two topics. Um, and that's been really useful because now each project that comes as a clear process that we're going through each time. Uh, to just kind of follow on and build upon that uh, at the practice hour as well, there's about kind of 90 odd people ish, so it's probably large-ish, but having that internal platform where you if you have some, if you have an in-house training, you record that. So it means that you're not having someone being resourced to give PHPP training multiple times over. You do it once and you have it. So it means when it comes to whole life carbon, when you get a new part one or a part two as part of their first few weeks, as part of kind of embedding them in the practice, you can say here is if you want to learn or you're particularly interested, you can access it and just that dive in. Because I was like happily overwhelmed to see I want to learn about this there's all these tools I've been asked to focus on whole life carbon where do I learn there's suddenly 10 20 hours of if you get stuck you don't you don't need to just absorb it but whilst you're it means that whilst you're doing a task or whilst you're trying a task you're able to go to this internal kind of uh, bank of knowledge and it's a really great thing that you can even run and is in a tab alongside so if you're not great at Revit or you're not particularly good at something you can just follow off and find a tutorial of someone that's explained it but it's like you're using resourcing tactically. So if you're going to do an in-house training, record it and file it, archive it, have it as something you can go back to because it's great for when you're getting people started in the practice or if they really want, if you want to try and upskill, you can do that select kind of really tactically, strategically. And it means you're not spending time over and over again. And you can also spread it if you're in multiple offices, you can watch it at different times or you can use it as a CPD and it's or something we found uh, if you have a CPD that is cancelled or can't happen, ACAN has the kind of circular economy CPD series. So we would watch that as a practice and then discuss it afterwards. So finding a resource and sharing it and then discussing it and how can we apply this to the work that we are doing right now? Where does this apply? And it was just a, it was a really good backstop. So it means that if suddenly you find like, oh, no, someone's cancelled or we can't find something, there is have a have an like a unless they're a library of resources you want to be working through so if you want to be keep, keeping cpd quite targeted and lively you can theme your cpd on circular economy natural materials passive house and it's just a really good way of having that structure in the background or being aware of other libraries that exist that you can direct staff to if they have a interest and want to learn as well but i think we're just about at the next poll if i've read the run sheet properly so uh, I was, yeah, we're good. Ah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> I think this sort of comes back to the questions that we had at the start about networking with with you, Diana, and working um, with the uh, heads of sustainability, but then also as part of uh, architects to Claire as well. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand a bit more on. Uh, how how you feel that like those working networks together means that you can draw knowledge from other people and um, share share your own as well. How has how has that sort of changed over time? And um, uh, where's where what what sort of advice would would you give to people for getting into networks as well? So a couple of questions in there. <laughs> um, I think it's 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 super useful because you can learn a lot from others doing similar things. And and I'm I'm learning a lot now from Zafir and Tara who are uh, doing the, the the very difficult part of part of actually uh, you know setting things up in in the practice um, and not having the, the the luck to have everything already kind of set up um, and that's that's a lot of work and I'm actually taking notes of how they do things which is uh, really really. Um, inspiring <laughs> um, and in in terms of kind of sharing with others um, for instance the the ad kind of um, uh, the master plan uh, the master class um, uh, series i think it's it's a 
an exceptional way of actually learning from others and, and sharing information and um, uh, meeting people who are uh, perhaps interested in the same topics and, and starting a conversation across practices. Um, we've started something also um, um, along the lines of uh, materials, uh, sustainable materials database that we just wanted to share across a few practices to just drop some ideas in there when, when somebody is just looking for um, uh, maybe a, a more sustainable and healthier uh, spec than what they would normally use on a project uh, to actually have something to go to and, and quickly find uh, inspiration in terms of materials. So we started a collaboration with other practices. And again, it was really good to see um, how people were willing to, to share ideas. Um, so it's, it's probably just having um, the opportunity and interest to, to, to start the, the conversation. And then things kind of go from there, I would say. So definitely getting involved with uh, ACAN and AD, I think it's, and Leti as well, um, is, is, uh, and supporting in, in, uh, in the practice, people who are interested to volunteer, uh, for instance, for Leti, Leti work, I, I think that's uh, really important. Right, fantastic. So we're going to now go into kind of breakout rooms about kind of that. Just double check to get the question right as well. I'm definitely keeping on top of this. So really about what would you like to share or learn? Because everyone, everyone who's came today is bringing different experiences and practice and education from outside of practice. And we just really love an open discussion to, for what would you like to share or learn? And on that same kind of theme about the kind of mentor or mentee, that's something we're going to come back to at some point. So we're going to have some breakout rooms and just have us all open a conversation as you'd like, share as much or as little, and we can just kind of keep this conversation going and everyone can participate and get a little bit more involved. So we're just going to kick these off and we'll be back in about kind of 10, 15 minutes, I think, or five. Right, I think that's everybody back. So I hope that was that was incredibly rich for us. Like I have, I've got multiple pages of notes. This is fantastic. Uh, Rebecca, would you like to like kick us off? And um, where we go next as well? I have a discussion from that chat that I'd love to continue, <laughs> if we're happy to. Um, we were talking in our group about whether to sort of we're sort of making first moves and steps in terms of sort of carbon calculation and passive house and things like that whether the best move is to do that in-house or whether to outsource that work and that led on to a conversation about um is it actually outsourcing if they're, they're sort of part of the design team and if you're very sort of integrated with the work you're doing so if you have someone on the team that's calculating carbon if they're part of the design team and you're working with them as actively as you would with sort of an MEPH engineer, is that actually outsourcing or is that just bringing someone else into the team? Um, but on the counterpart, how um, productive it can be to even on a small scale do things like that in-house because you have something a bit more tangible to sort of show to your clients and there's more of a sort of in-house understanding of those aspects. I don't know if anyone else has got any anything to lead on with on that. Oh, we actually just um, ended our breakout room with that discussion, so maybe I could <laughs> go into that. So we, uh, yeah, we did, somebody else just asked that same question about yeah monitoring, and I think as a practice, we, it was almost like being slightly like cheeky and asking like favors of our consultants because when we completed um, a school, I think Winteringham School, and it was like in the press recently for um, when it like being a really sustainable project, but we wanted to yeah, measure the amount of carbon and as a practice we just don't have the facilities or the tools to like get that kind of data so we asked the engineering uh, company we were working with whether they would like grant it whether they were able to run the test for us on essentially a pro bono basis because it was not necessary for the project it was already built it was already like basically finished they had no I guess further ties to it but just trying to convince that it would be mutually beneficial to actually have this data for us and them to like moving forward being able to say we designed this or we have this project and these are the values rather than just like being verbal um 
and it was, it was yeah, I think the most like valuable thing we ever did because it was, we got so much information from it and we still like are posting about and still using that information to inform um, so many other projects and even for us as a practice, just having that to benchmark our own projects. So even if we never test the other ones, we know we did this for this school. These are the results that it got. If we use the same principles for these next ones, we know we're kind of on the right track. So yeah, I think asking, uh, yeah, it was keeping it in house, I guess, to answer your question is like fine, like even within the design team, especially if um, you're working with like, yeah, I guess, progressive engineers and people who like have the facilities to run it, because definitely make use of those resources. Um, just to kind of um, follow up on that as well. <laughs> um, we started by kind of aiming to do a lot of a lot of the analysis ourselves and then we have some of the tools um, in-house but then we realized that actually there's so much work that needs to be done on a project that is super helpful if the analysis can be done by consultants as part of their scope so now we're trying to make sure that the scope includes from the start not like as Afir is saying not, not necessarily trying on every project to get that little bit of analysis done um, on the side which we tried as well um, but just to have it as a specific uh, part of their scope and services um, and and that is just to make sure that the analysis is done at the uh, right stages when we need it, repeated later on at later design stages, for instance, the, the LCA and so on. Um, at the same time, it's really good, also like Safir is saying, to be able to do that little bit of analysis um, when and if needed, like a little bit of analysis of the um, impact of various materials in the facade or um, different types of structure in, in a building if the structure engineer is, isn't doing that himself or themselves. Um, but um, it's, 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 a, it's a balance, it's a mix. And if, if, um, if that can be part of the consultant scope, I would say, um, yes, go for that. Um, but it's good to have people training, trained in-house as well to be able to, to do a little bit of analysis here and there when needed. Which Probably sort of a mix. Oh, sorry. <laughs> which which sort of consultants are these? Are these specialists that you're going to, or are they uh, no, are like part of MNE, part of structures, part of? Yeah, MEP would probably uh, be the ones doing uh, life cycle analysis um, and operational energy, a proper um, you know energy model like PHPP or TM54 or IES or something like that. Um, and then the structure engineers can do uh, their bit on the structural side for um, kind of appraisal at early design stages before you start to do a, a proper LCA with the MEP or sustainability consultant and so on. So I would say for an energy model and embodied carbon, definitely the MEP can can help. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, where we are. Yeah, the, the uh, follow on as well uh, at the practice I'm at, there is now like a consultancy wing of the practice that because of because we decided to look into building up these skills that can in turn turn into very different types of work that you're doing. Uh, for example, there's a scheme in Wales where if you want to get as a wet co, so to get more money for a school, if you can demonstrate it's got an, it hits their embodied carbon target, you get additional funding. But if you want to secure certain types of tenders, you're starting to have to demonstrate that you can hit this. So we've had uh, clients approach us and say, uh, contractors saying, we are wanting to hit this target. We don't have the capability in-house to do it. Can you do that? So that can actually become a part of your practice. So by building up these skills in-house, you can start to diversify your work, but you can also bring that learning into your own sort of practice. So part of uh, at Archetype, we use Ecolab, and that's part of what I do in kind of Perform Plus. And we look at the kind of the whole life carbon and that's a very, so I don't do much regular part two work. It's mostly just the kind of the weird odds and ends, but it's like you can have part twos who is, it's actually economically viable that they are learning to do this stuff and they're able to, you know, giving people who've got a passion and an interest and there's more people than you'd expect do not mind a spreadsheet and are super happy to learn about POE. And if you ever get the opportunity to say, some certain types of buildings like museums have to do certain types of monitoring anyway 
to demonstrate they are able to keep these environments controlled. So you can look into saying, can we, if we work on, say, a museum, a store, a store, can we get that data? Can we see how that works? Can we fine tune it? And POE can be incredibly light touch. POE does not have to be all of the monitoring straight away. It can be your like online web platform. You can check from a distance and it can be that, but it doesn't have to start that way. Uh, I worked for a practice in Glasgow where they built up their post occupancy by doing a KTP with a university. So that is another avenue you can look into if we're wanting to diversify, how can we upskill whilst kind of disseminating research whilst doing something else at the same time. So there's so many avenues you can look at that are very non-traditional, but there's lots of possibility there as well. So you can, I think we've probably covered everything on the spectrum from, yes, you can do it in-house and it can be it can be business to you can include it in scope. So you can pretty much do anything on that, but it's just worth considering what are the core benefits and the additional values or the different ways you could be bringing things into the work as well because there are so many ways than doing it just the traditional route but i would probably leave it at that as well uh Vince, do you have anything else from your uh, discussion you want to follow on from as well yeah i think well i think we were, we were sort of speaking about the um the the mentoring side of it um there's a couple of questions that came about wanting to be involved in, in practice mentorship and um those like facilitating those networks between between practices um so there's a lot a lot, lot of sort of um points about um wanting to have more accountability um uh and sort of holding both like yourself and your practice to, to certain targets but then um uh, uh having having external uh others come and say oh you, you guys need to do try this or um maybe you guys should, should th think a bit more about um uh, something else and, and tweak tweak those sort of things and come in and sort of a, maybe assess them on on some sort of aspects. Um, I, was, I was yeah maybe maybe a question for for Diana and Tara um, about that sort of part of um, setting targets and um, what happens if you don't meet them and if there's um, uh, sort of discussions that happen in house about that. Should I go first, Tara? Uh? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Um, so we we organized this um, kind of uh, away day with everybody in the office, um, just talking about sustainability, having uh, speakers over, doing workshops, and that was um, just after I, I joined the practice. And then we did another one um, last year in November, kind of two years on. Um, just to kind of see where we are at and how we've done in the meantime and we've done a little kind of summary of all of our projects where we are in terms of um you know are we targeting things on on how many of them um uh, what level of performance what type of analysis are we doing energy models are we doing lca or whole life carbon analysis um and um how many of them are you know um fossil fuel free and so on and that's a very good way of actually saying okay we we made some progress uh we still have a long way to go but it's 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 really good to have this moment of taking stock and and kind of saying are we are we pushing enough can we push a little bit more um and are we doing as well as we think we're doing because unless you start to look at the numbers and actually assess every project, you, you won't you won't know if you're on your way there or not. So it's it's good to do this kind of moment of, of um, kind of summary of projects, project audit, <laughs> where we are at. Yeah, that's that's my my view. Yeah, no, I, I think that that absolutely makes sense. I think ours are um, slightly different in that. So all our projects and that's why it was important to start with saying so the how we set our store out and therefore what clients we have so all our projects meet some type of sustainability standard or design to anyway whether that be RIBA or Letty or whatever it is there is something in-house we're designing to so the design aspect of things and that's because we're small enough nimble enough young enough can be a little bit gung-ho enough to do that we're not established with established um, clients with with, with their established um, roots, if you like. So it's slightly easier, if you like, for us to be able to do that. So that's part one. I think the second part is 
um, what happens when we don't meet the targets. And I think this is really important. So we try to do as much learning as we can when we're small enough to get everybody around the table quite quickly, because we're literally around the table together anyway. So um, we tend to do like site visits um, and identify for example, um, a project is supposed to meet RIBA 2030, and we've we've um, specified wood fiber everywhere. And in the last two years, wood fiber has tripled in price. And they've done wood fiber for for floors, our, our walls, um, and we've come to the roof level. And now they're like, well, PIR, and having those conversations, and them being very real, um, and trying to hold our clients to account to say, yeah, but you've plastered this everywhere in terms of this. This is you're, you're marketing this higher. Um, standard. So try to hold them to account in that way and identify if we lose arguments, why that is. And the prep, like every part two, everybody being part of that process so they understand. And I think it's really important so that we are not naive in that because we've designed something to a particular goal doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen because there are other forces beyond our control. And we're not going to say to a developer or contractor, Right, right. Um, you know, because we want to meet the standard, your development, you know, I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. So we try to make every opportunity um a, a learning opportunity. We do quite a few project reviews. Um, and I think what's really useful to or what's certainly beautiful here to um to have understood is that when we are not in the room as directors, that the team are asking the same questions we would ask. It's, you know, what, what, yeah, but why aren't we meeting a uh, your value of this and how can we meet that? So it's, it's getting the principles firmly in everybody's mind so that the questions are always being asked. Um, but in terms of reviewing it, we, we do learning. I, I think it's just part of the process. So we can't, I can't say, oh, we sit down every Friday and do it because it literally is just part of sort of daily daily work what really stood out there that i'm really interested to hear more about is holding your clients to account and what what are the conversations like when you hold clients to account because i think that's probably what slightly scares people and just to say like you have committed to this this is what and i think it's really powerful that you said this is what you're marketing it as so like when a client is saying this is our flagship net zero x y and z we're going to have all these wonderful things how have clients responded when you've held them to account? Because I think that's really valuable to know. And I think that's a good thing to learn. And it'd be good to have one example where it went badly and one example where it went well. So we've got just the contrast, just so we've got the spectrum. Uh, so would you be happy in answering that, Tara, as well? Because that's, I was... We stopped the recording now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now we're gone badly. <laughs> Um, no, that's a that's a good question. So um, it's so maybe I'll start with the good part, it, which is um, which is in the holding clients to account. We spent a lot of time and effort and energy up front um, describing why we were meeting what we were meeting and getting them to buy into that so that it made it onto the marketing. It made it onto the hoarding. It was so important for them and selling themselves as the best developers on the street, understanding that their homes are going to sell quicker. Their homes are going to be, you know, top of the market ETC. So we sold the dream. They bought into the dream and that's important to do at the first bit. So that again, coming back to, we, the architects don't need to be the advocates because I think if we do our job well, the, the, the whole team is the advocate and the clients is the advocate, the contractor is the advocate. Um, so that was really important at the beginning because once it gets into marketing and the, on the hoarding, and this is what we're now giving to Knight Frank or whoever, this is the standard. So even though it's still um, in construction and then we come to a position where uh, timber has tripled in price, we can say, well, okay, what is the, and that that's therefore the, the other side of things, um, but what's the give and take? And we found actually during construction for one reason or another, we actually changed some of our um, design decisions from masonry to timber. And so therefore actually could that therefore be balanced out? So we thought we were going to do even better on our embodied carbon, but because we're now using a different type of insulation, it's not going to balance itself out. For us, it's okay because, well, that's where we are and we still get the overall um, goals that we wanted to because we'd already made a decision that was trying to um, better what we what we wanted. And I think that's the useful thing at the design stage, so not meeting the target, but trying to go beyond because you recognize that 
then someone's going to pour too much concrete so the concrete mix is not supposed is not um as as designed and allowing for further down the line decisions being made that are beyond our control so i think those are hopefully two um two options and our clients have been amazing in being held to account because we always come back to whatever dis whatever discussion we have we always come back to yeah but you said you want you want to achieve this it's not even us you want to achieve this um and we've been very lucky to have good clients so well, thank you very much. That was probably a question we should have. Well, I had the idea on the spot. You said held to account, and I just thought I can definitely ask this now. So thank you very much for the, the honesty there and taking the surprise in stride. Even to kind of extend that question slightly, uh, Dan, have you ever had the same sort of how do those discussions go with clients when you've set a target, they've said they're going to buy into it, they say that's in the brief, they've got it, you've got kind of You've gone through the stages, they're sticking to it, they're sticking to it, and then they suddenly say, but no, we, we just we, we want our standard. How how have that how has that sort of thing been handled in the past from a sustainability point of view? If that's something that you can also answer. Because that's I think the those sorts of things with clients are we don't talk about the good and the bad ones and the difficult ones often enough. I think it's it's really valuable that we can kind of start to do so as well. Yeah. Um so you're asking when when that's already in the brief and mm -hmm. then and then things slip yeah. along the way, which happens mm -hmm. quite a lot. Um it's yeah, it's it's difficult. It's a tough, tough moment. Um and it's always kind of trying to hang on to what you think it's it's the most important or or easiest to achieve target or area. So if um if our design toolkit looks at um, you know, um, operational energy, op uh, embodied carbon, um, biodiversity, water use, and so on. Out of all of these topics, you you basically identify which are the easiest wins on your project and try and do as, as best as you can in those areas. And that's where you'll probably try and achieve the plus. And then when these discussions um, come along, we, you start to figure out which are the areas that you can actually still push onto and what will um, you know, probably decrease in terms of uh, target or performance or, or things like that. And uh, because we are an EOT, um, we, we started to have something called an EOT forum. Um, and uh, it's been really interesting to see uh, people actually bring up the one project which is not super duper amazing in, in the office and actually talk about it openly and say, um, look, why did we take that on and and um, have directors actually uh, very um, transparently actually share how the project started at certain levels and of performance and then things slip and then the question was, should we continue, um, is the project actually feasible with the targets that they had set initially or um, and, and are we probably the best people who can, you know, try and, and push as much as possible at that point um, um, and, and make it the best it can be. So the fact that, I think the fact that we, we had the, the conversation and, and um, all this discussion about how do you um, assess what projects you want to work on, um, how do you take them on, is there like a sustainability column when you, when you uh, take projects on. Um, um, and also, even, even if, this, if, even if the um, initial goals might not be that ambitious, ambitious uh, the fact that you um, you know uh, can have that conversation in the beginning of the project if they're open enough to say we're willing to have that conversation I think that's super important um, and uh, trying the best you can basically at every project meeting basically pushing and pushing and pushing and slowly also you'll get help I found from consultants who basically when when they hear you speak up and say let's let's aim for that because it's it's achievable you'll get people actually join in and 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 help and and say yes actually we can do that let's let's help out um it's it it doesn't always work but it's um um it can be it can be fun Uh, do we have any kind of final questions that uh, Vince or Rebecca would like to kind of put forward just uh, before we wrap up? 
just kind of one more beyond this kind of one and see where we end up. Yeah, I've got I've got I've got one uh, which I hope hopes hopes all right, uh, but it's about um, it's it's about the sort of architects being involved in in this uh, in advocacy and uh, maybe becoming more outwardly vocal, not just to clients, but getting involved in wider um, things. I'm not I'm not just uh, advocating just for ACAN. Uh, now, uh, obviously, that's one thing. Uh, one action for everyone is go and join uh, join our, our WhatsApp chat to come and uh, continue the conversation later. Um, but it's yeah, it's like uh, sort of set, setting your stall up, setting the architect stall up, and and saying this is th th these are sort of lines I'm I'm not going to cross. And uh, uh, I was just wondering whether anyone had any thoughts on thoughts on that. Maybe a tricky one. <laughs> I, I, I think we've seen the change that was brought about by um, Architects Declare or Leti in you know working with volunteers. I think that's amazing. It is amazing work. It it just blows my mind when I think of it. And Aiken, of course, <laughs> who can who can say, you know, it's 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 incredible. And that's just just the power of everyone actually speaking up and. Um, we should all be doing that in each of our kind of little corners and nooks. I think to kind of book in that question, uh, have any of you, have you ever been approached for work on the basis of signing up to like a declaration you've made or has someone seen you something you've said in the press and came to your practice and said, because this is something you've spoke outwardly about or I read this, because there's for one example, there was a recent kind of campaign called End Gas Now which is essentially everyone that signed up is refusing to install any new fossil fuel based heating systems on the premise that uh, any new fossil fuels we start to put the infrastructure in for are going to be there for 10, 15 years. So it's, it is literally the minimum baseline with the IPCC saying that we shouldn't have any fossil fuels in buildings from 2020. So it is the minimum baseline, but that's still quite provocative in today's climate where things are quite difficult to push but it would be fantastic to end on have you has anyone got a story of they've been approached based on advocacy have you ever won work or been invited to do work based on your advocacy outwardsly from your practice I think that would be quite a nice ending even if it's a quick kind of anything at all in that vein would be fantastic I, I think we might have been just because of Architects Declare and Steve's work on that. I think we probably have, and especially on that side of, of our, uh, that type of sector, uh, performance spaces, I'm pretty sure that that has happened, yes. I'd say the same here. Um, I think uh, most of our, I think all of our clients come because we're involved in uh, LETI or um, AD, ETC. And I just want to um, add very quickly that on advocacy, advocacy looks different for everyone. Um, and I, I think it's important to recognize that people are able to be um, advocates in very many different ways. And because that's not um, in an out, outwardly um, outspoken way or on the front line or sticking your hand um, to, to a building doesn't mean that advocacy doesn't happen. So I think it's important to recognize even where privilege sits within advocacy. Um, so advocacy is important. It's important to recognize the broad spectrum of what advocacy looks like. All right. I think that's an incredible note for us to get to wrap up on. And um, thank you all so much for bringing your own experiences and uh, having this really open conversation and for responding to questions when we surprised you a little bit and just running with it so well. So thank you, a huge, huge thank you to all of our guests. And a massive thank you for everyone who stuck around until the end as well. Uh, we Once the recording stopped, we can just have a very informal chat and just keep it going just a little bit. If people would like to, it's probably quite sunny where you are. It's not in Scotland, but it probably is everywhere else. But if you'd like to stay for a chat, that's fantastic. But again, just thank you so much to our guests for your time, uh, to our facilitators and our ACAN host in the background, Glow, who has kept this going so smoothly as well. So thank you to everyone for a really fantastically rich conversation.